When the first white settlers came to this part of the world, their main enemies, as they saw things, were the blacks and the trees. And they did everything possible to get rid of them both. This area, famous for its red gums, was almost completely cleared in 30 years. Initially, the response was great. Plenty of grass for all the sheep and cattle, and plenty of room to grow crops. What we didn't realise, though, was that at the same time, we had cleared all the bush's natural support systems, and we'd left the land, the soil, completely exposed. When you remove the trees, most of the birds have nowhere to go, nowhere to nest. Because the land was cleared down to the level of the topsoil, wildlife was forced away. After supporting the bush, the soil had plenty of nutrition. But gradually, the production levels started to fall. Without the bugs and organisms mixing the soil, the structure and the nutrient levels break down. The soil has to be ploughed to control weeds and may have stock trampling it, so the soil becomes compacted and water doesn't easily filter through. The drainage problem is exacerbated as there are few deep-rooted plants to use the water where it falls. And without trees to catch the rain, which actually softens much of the fall, the water must find another way off the land. Equally so with no vegetation on the ridges. Rainwater runs off the high ground, eroding old gullies and creating new ones. Of course, with water running across the land and not seeping through, it takes the topsoil with it. Trees also play a major role in the flow of air and its effect on ground temperature. As soil dries or is cultivated, wind erosion comes into its own and summer losses of soil are common. And this tree tells the whole story. Ring bark, 60 or 70 years ago, the original level of the topsoil was here. Since then, the forces of nature, grazing and cultivation have taken it right down to here. What would it be? Uh, 45 centimetres of the very best topsoil, gone forever. You know, trees are the greatest natural pumps in the world. And this red gum used to pump thousands of litres from the water table every day. Without this special form of evaporation, called evapotranspiration, the symptoms of excess soil water appear. Sheet, gully and tunnel erosion, soil compaction and salinity. It's the pumping action of trees which, more than any other factor, moderates the depth of the water table. As it rises, it brings underground salts to the surface with it. Not only does salting destroy parts of our productive land, but when you collect together a community of farms with the same problem, often drinking water and the town's supply are turned saline. Throughout all this change, many farmers, not surprisingly, found that they couldn't keep up the initial strong levels of growth. What they didn't realise, and certainly many agriculturalists too, was that their soils lacked a support system, which would certainly limit their long-term viability. They knew that there was a mineral deficiency, which was limiting the growth of Australia's crops and pastures. So they tried poultry and other animal manures, but it wasn't nearly enough. And then phosphate deficiency was pinpointed, and along came super. The response was fantastic. It was like giving the crops a fix on a drug, and they really took off on it. At the same time, another revolution was underway with machinery, land-clearing machinery. It meant that we could tackle huge areas of country we never thought possible before, especially in Western Australia, Central Queensland and Western New South Wales. We put land under the plough then that we probably should never have tackled, but that's another story. And so while productivity per hectare was going down, productivity per farm unit was going up as we increased the size of farms and we took on this whole new area of country. 
So we were lucky enough to have the space and the technology to lay the foundation for this remarkable industry, which, let's face it, has been the foundation of this country's prosperity up until now. But the lack of a natural support system continued to chip away at the land's stability, and new problems arose. For example, the pest problems. The small range of animals and insects which fed on our farmlands really thrived. With little competition, plagues of them. In addition, infections began. Fungus, bacteria. As happened with super, farmers looked to scientists to come up with solutions. But as fast as new products came onto the market, the pests developed immunity to them. And we are forever looking for long-term solutions. Well, I think you become a victim of the time you live in. And, and you know, a lot of those farmers were, were, were victims of the time that they lived in and the advice that they received. And, and when we've got cases now where, you know, the, the advice wasn't good. And in fact, government encouraged land clearing and all those sorts of things. And, and at the time, that seemed like the right thing to do. I think uh, farmers uh, in Australia have done a lot of, spent a lot of their time fighting against nature up until uh, just recently. Now we're starting to turn around and uh, I'm quite sure we can use nature if we get the ecological chain uh, going again. We've talked about the wind erosion on the, on the tablelands and, and we've got these saline soaks coming out the sides of the hills and that's all a, a direct effect of, of the clearing of the original vegetation. The, the red gums were uh, practically touching, they were forming a canopy over that country as well there was the understory of trees and shrubs and uh, also the native grasses that were good water users as well. And at that stage, uh, before white man started to uh, farm our country, uh, that local water table was at uh, 12 to 15 metres below the surface. Now, I measured, uh, I've got about a uh, dozen piezometers, small bores from measuring that local water table. I measured them uh, yesterday and uh, they varied from uh, uh, 2.8 uh, metres uh, below the surface, the furthest down I had to go, to uh, 100 uh, millimetres, four inches below uh, the, the surface of the ground. That's the, the changes that we've made. I think one of the problems we have as, as, as ordinary farmers as we perceive ourselves is that is when, when people come up with words like biomass and uh, um, some of the other words that have been used today, that we get a bit frightened off. And uh, but when, when you start explaining what biomass is, we all think, oh, yeah, well, I know what that is. I've been doing that for a long time. When this country loses 80% of its trees or even more, just how vulnerable is it? It's very exposed, Neil, in many ways. We're open to the wind, for example, but also to sun, our stock you can see them seeking a little bit of shelter over, uh, shade over there. Uh, water, we've exposed our farm to, to the elements. We've got nothing drawing up the water that's now falling on our open farms. The land will never be the same again. You can't go backwards, but you can take a simple understanding of the land's ecology and through careful planning, establish new ways to protect our soils. To go from this to this. There are four principles of ecology which we've applied to the Potter properties. The diversity, the biomass, the flow systems, and the native systems on the property. Yeah, the stock have been out of this for about 10 years uh, now, Neil, so they get a bit of uh, grass regenerating. This is uh, Banksia marginata, this fella. He does well in the sandier, drier areas. Yeah, you've got a lot of different types in here. You certainly are. The red gums, the swamp gums, yeah, the, and a lot of, lots of paper barks do well in here. What's the idea behind all that? Diversity. Diversity. We, some won't go, but the others are going to do really well. So we've got to find out what, what does well here. We want a range of species. And uh, a range of species supports a range of wildlife, Neil. Different birds suit different trees, etc. So. Yeah. Is That's, that a principle yeah. then you've all followed here, that you've got to have a, a number of tree species? Oh, yes, most definitely we follow that principle both for our tree species and our pasture species. Uh, I think uh, the more trees we get back, the more supporting mechanisms, fungus, bacteria, 
will get uh, accompanying the tree. So therefore they will look after the soils better. The principle of diversity applies to the range of flora and fauna, the bugs and microorganisms in the soil, and the different soil types. The more diverse an ecology is, the more resilient it is. On a farm, it will mean deeper, healthier, and better drained soils, less wind effect on production. The air will be milder immediately above the ground, and there'll be a greater number of predators to balance the insect and wildlife. The farm will be more stable to withstand changes from outside forces such as weather extremes and cultivation. Diversity can be observed in numerous forms. Different landscapes, the variety of vegetation, a fauna and the important role they play in the control of pests and diseases, the variety of uses one property is put to, and the range of soils on any one property. If there is limited diversity, the land may function well until a major outside force interferes, and then the consequences can be disastrous. Biomass refers to the vegetation, the fauna, soils and root systems, crops and stock, in fact, everything that comprises the matter that forms the base for growth or production. It all adds up to the total biomass. Logically, the greater the biomass in a balanced form, the greater the land's potential to produce income. Uh, up until this stage, we've just been pushing as much out of the soil as we possibly could. We've got to look a lot more at sustaining agriculture. Well, how do we do that easily? I mean, is it just by getting better perennial pastures like you've talked about? I, I don't think there's a one single answer. I don't think there are any easy, quick fix answers. Mm -hmm. I think uh, there are a number of measures we can take. Uh, certainly pasture species is one, a build up of biomass. We can build up organic matter within our soils. I think more above the soil will probably mean better life below the soil. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can look at, at, at different and uh, fertiliser application, for example, we've, we've been used to applying superphosphate in, in the past and we've changed our soil as a result and perhaps now we need to be looking at uh, liming, for example. If you had an ideal situation here, Peter, I mean, what would you be doing in the next five to ten years to increasing the fertility of your soil? I want to get much, uh, much more pasture onto, these, uh, onto this area. Neil, I want to get uh, a wider diversity of grasses. I want to increase the biomass in this area. You mean you want to build up the, well, the total concentration of, of grass and, of course, roots under the ground? That's right. It'll be a much healthier situation above the ground and below the ground. A lot more organic matter. A lot more organic, organic matter rotting down into the ground. That's going to help the whole process. Well, those trees down there have done pretty well, haven't they? Done really well there, really mm. well. The right species in the right place. Mm. But not too many up there on the top. No, oh, I haven't got started up there yet, but that's, that's the, the next area. Oh, does it worry you uh, that you've got to take off or, I mean, fence off a lot of country that you can't put stock onto? I mean, you're not getting production out of it. No, we are getting production out of it. We argue that fiercely how? all the time. Tell now. me how. <laughs> it's area unavailable for grazing, but area assisting production. Uh, oh. <laughs> it's making a more temperate, helping develop a more temperate climate over our farm, for example. Oh. And grasses as well as animals appreciate that. They grow better. But surely your gross income goes down. We haven't lost any production now. We've just held it at the same. And perhaps now that we're just starting to see the first of the uh, acceleration. As we start to get uh, a little shelter from, from these trees, they're starting to get up to the size now where instead of the wind whistling across the paddocks and uh, drying them out, uh, these trees are slowing the, the speed down and uh, there's not the evaporation. Now listen, <laughs> in the current climate, with farm costs going like that, how can you stay in the business if you're not getting more production? Exactly, and that's the challenge we need to face, to get more production from less but healthier soils, and I believe it's our only option. And we don't ask anymore, can we afford these measures? We say to ourselves, we must apply these measures to achieve a lift in production. We must apply them. But in the meantime, you go broke. 
No, in the meantime, we don't go broke. In the meantime, there are many examples, Peter's Farm, our farm, and, and, and a number of others around the state where, without going into the nuts and bolts of A, B and C dollars, you, people can look on them and say, OK, they are practical working farms. Those fellas are making money. We can demonstrate that our net return per hectare on our farm, for example, is well above the district average. Biomass also refers to the matter underground. Peter Waldron has developed the biomass in the last 10 years. Originally, it was something like this. As a rule of thumb, the amount of biomass determines the amount of food the land produces, be it crops or stock. Looking at a barren farm, the biomass as the basis for production appears to be very limited. Little or no vegetation, except for short pasture growth, a shallow layer of topsoil, and limited subsoils down to a high water table. The term flow systems refers to the movement of water and air around a farm and how they affect production. Water provides the basis for all living things, and being at the centre of living matter, it must be balanced to maintain an environment, or that environment will suffer, be there too much or too little water. Winds shape landscapes and to a large extent determine the growth of living things by the amounts of energy that plants and animals burn up through wind stress, both hot and cold winds. I've never heard of anybody talk about managing the air and the water on their farms. What do you mean by that? Well, a big part of uh, planting the trees, Neil, as many trees as we have, into windbreaks and shelter belts is to slow the wind speed down going across our farms. Ah. Likewise with water, we need to slow down uh, surface water runoff, use as much water wherever we can as it falls on the farm. How have you done that here? Uh, well, pasture work is a great part of water control. We've got some... Uh, some surface drains that harvest water high up the slope. What, you mean you've got water apart from this beautiful dam here, way up the hill, have you? Oh, yes, yes. And what, what are the main advantages of doing that? Well, in, in fact, we can distribute water from high up the slope uh, because we've got good pressure up there, gravity pressure, to uh, any spot on our farm. So as we've created new management units, therefore new paddocks, therefore needing stock water to the new paddocks, it's been easy for us to uh, get it there via uh, our gravity feed system from our high dam. Done the same sort of thing, Peter? Yeah, very much so, uh, Neil. We're using the trees to keep the salty water down below the surface as it doesn't run off the creek down to our neighbours. Now we've just got the cleaner surface water running off down there, uh, just a flush in winter. Mm. So that, in a way, uh... <laughs> More than ever before, you're in charge of the water, you're in charge of the air in your own place. Oh, I, I, I think in charge is too extreme a term. We'll <laughs> Nature's a pretty strong element and we're trying to work with it at least and we're trying to control it as best we can. Mm -hmm. Certainly. The fourth principle of the ecological process is the land's native systems. Those which evolved over millions of years in the Australian environment. They're valuable because they hold some important secrets to sustainable life in these conditions. By nurturing these natural systems, a farmer can develop an environment on his farm to better cope with Australian conditions. For example, in drought conditions, some native grasses survive better than many introduced species, and they can supplement exotic pasture species. Some plant species are tolerant of salt, some to flooding. Some plants are deep-rooted. Certain species of trees grow exceptionally well in certain indigenous soils. Some tea trees are suited to salty flooded areas. Certain native fauna species can control insects in dry times. The list goes on and on. I wanted to tell you that uh, a long while ago, when I was young, 
I w first went to a property uh, up on the Queensland border, a place called Krubel. And the boss used to take me around the paddock. And as we'd walk around, he'd talk to me about all the trees on this property, how that one was drought resistant, that one was good for feeding sheep. And also, he'd stop as we'd go along and he'd put leaves and twigs and a bit of bark in the, in the uh, sheep pads. And I'd ask him why. And he said, really, what I'm trying to do is stop the ground washing away because there's, it had a, it wasn't very sloping, but it had a slight slope. But he said, if I don't do that, it really is going to, and he used the word that I'd never heard of before, called erode. Anyway, years later, I went back to this property and he showed me what had happened on the boundary fence. The guy next door had cleared away every tree and there was a gully right over the top of my head. So, you know, that guy really, throughout my life, has affected my thinking about trees. And I'm just wondering how you feel about native scrub now, particularly since you've been involved in the Potter program. Well, they're encouraging us to look much harder at our native trees and shrubs, birds and insects. Neil, we've been late developers in that line, actually. We've farmed sheep and cattle and not thought so much about birds and snakes and lizards in the past. We now realise, with the help of our friends, uh, that they can help us on our farm, so... In what way are they helping you, though? Well, birds, for instance, uh, can consume massive amounts of insects. Just our simple old magpies are great friend, but the little wrens and so forth can also consume uh, a lot of our unwanted predators on our farm. In fact, I've read uh, recently that um, if we had a desirable population of birds across our farm, they would consume up to 60% of unwanted predators. And the estimation was that on a farm like ours, we had about 5% of the desired number of birds. So, so they can save us a hell of a lot in terms of chemicals to begin with. Right. Well, would you keep as much scrub as we've got here on your place, Peter, to do that sort of thing? If I was lucky enough to have it, I certainly would be hanging on to it. I'd take all measures that I could to hang on to it. It's very valuable, I think, Neil. But you wouldn't run many sheep or cattle with this sort of scrub. I wouldn't, I wouldn't let the sheep or cattle in here. It's too valuable as a source of seed, as a, a source of animals to, to spread out uh, the insects, the, the spiders, the snakes, perhaps. Ah. To spread. So are you both saying that every farm needs some natural areas on it? Well, it would be good. And unfortunately, it's too late for that over most of Australia. But if it's there, let's hang on to it. Would you let some of your country regenerate, go back to what it was before? Most certainly, Neil. In fact, uh, just through the fence here, w we aim to uh, fence out areas to allow natural regeneration so that it might get back to a stage like this. That's an easier way to do it than it is to actually physically plant back, but we're also doing a hell of a lot of that as well because we've lost so much seed source over our farm that we haven't got the opportunity for great amounts of natural regeneration. Well, look, how much can you afford to let go back to native scrub and still keep up your gross income? Maybe 10%. I don't think we know yet, but it's, it's so valuable, I'm quite sure that we've got to hang on to any that we've got. And we've got to try and revegetate as much as we can until we, we can see just what we do need on our farms. It's early days yet. Whilst ecology is a science, don't get bogged down with these four principles. They're intended as a guide to gain a deeper understanding of farmland. As the planning unfolds in the next video, one of the major objectives is to incorporate these principles into the plan, to increase the farm's diversity, to put more body or biomass into the soil, to influence the flow of air and water, and to protect and develop the farm's native systems.